2016, the, at the Southern Baptist Convention, there was much made of uh, the lack of baptisms within our Southern Baptist churches. And statistics were shared of the way in which over a span of a number of years, uh, baptisms had decreased within our Southern Baptist churches. So with that, there was a task force launched uh, to study and investigate, hey, what's at the root cause of why our Southern Baptist churches seem to have such a decline in baptisms? Two years later, a task force reported 2018 and uh, gave the results of their study. And one of their major conclusions was that Southern Baptist churches have done a good job on placing an emphasis on evangelism, but we've been weak in highlighting or emphasizing the need for biblical discipleship. Robbie Gallaty, who was the chair of that task force, said this at the convention, and I quote, brothers and sisters, I submit that we continue calling for evangelism, but let's not do it without a plan for biblically discipling believers. Why? Because we will see the same results that we've seen for two decades within our churches. So Gallaty maintained that discipleship could serve as a cure for many of the woes that we see within our congregations and within our convention. And when he gave the report of the committee, they shared that many things within our churches like giving, serving, and witnessing could be likened to fruits that grow from a root of discipleship. We know this when we study the New Testament. Discipleship is at the heart of Christianity. It's at the heart of Christ's movement. Believers should be well acquainted with this word, disciple. When Jesus was on the earth, he called disciples to follow him. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1. The term disciple was used in the first century for an individual who followed a rabbi, who followed that rabbi's lifestyle and teaching. At the root of this word disciple was a word, a Greek word that meant to learn. We're reminded that as long as we are on this earth, we are called to learn from our rabbi, our master, our Lord, Jesus. Interestingly, when Jesus called disciples unto himself, he selected 12, Mark chapter 3, verse number 4. That number was significant because in Old Testament times, there were 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jesus, in selecting 12 disciples, indicated that he had come to earth to start a movement that could be likened in magnitude to that movement that was started through Abraham. Furthermore, through selecting 12, Jesus indicated that all of his teaching, all of his truth, his life was intended to be a fulfillment of what we found in Abraham and in the prophecies of the Old Testament. In fact, to, to highlight the importance of his discipleship movement, Jesus often used the term the 12 as an official title or moniker of his disciples. Even after Judas had betrayed Jesus and hung himself, the title the 12 was used of the 11. This was meant to signify the importance, the heavenly nature of Jesus' discipleship movement. In fact, when you study the Bible, you find in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 4 and verse number 10, that right now around the throne of God, there are 24 elders, symbolic language, 24 elders worshiping the Lord, the presence of God. There the Lord is as a consuming fire, the God of light is there right now in the third heaven in the presence of God. Jesus is there, the book of Revelation tells us. 
standing as a lamb who has been slain. And the Holy Spirit is there as a fire burning. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit now dwell in the presence of God, a place Paul called the third heaven. And in that place, there are, symbolically speaking, 24 elders. Why 24? 12 of them represent God's people from the Old Testament times, 12 elders. And 12 of them represent God's people from the New Testament times. There are believers of all dispensations and all ages right now before the throne of God, worshiping God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the emphasis on 12 underscores the importance, the high value, the heavenly nature of our Lord's discipleship movement. And for all of eternity, we find in Scripture, the 12 disciples will be, be memorialized in the new heaven and the new earth as Scripture tells us, John the Revelator tells us in Revelation 21, 14, the capital city of the new heaven and the new earth will have inscriptions, inscriptions honoring the 12 disciples. All of this church this morning highlights the heavenly nature, the high value of discipleship. This morning, for our vision month, we are putting focus on this thing called discipleship. We know this, as a church, we have a purpose. It's given to us in the great commandment that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Our purpose is highlighted in the great commission, wherein Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. You take those two great teachings together, the great commandment and the great commission, and we as a church like to say, we exist here at Tabernacle to connect people to their ultimate purpose in life in Jesus Christ. That's why we have a church. But in order to fulfill that purpose, we as a, the body of Christ need to regularly take action on certain priorities. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, you see that there were certain habits or behaviors the early church regularly engaged in. One of those was worship. They regularly got together on the Lord's Day, the new Sabbath, and sang songs and lis listened to the proclamation of Scripture. Another one of those habits was this idea of fellowship. They normally gathered together as the body of Christ in small groups and shared life with one another and enjoyed Christian community and friendship. We've talked about those two priorities over the last two weeks. This morning, we want to focus on this priority of discipleship. The church ought to be a place of learning, of people growing as followers of Jesus. Growing, 2 Peter 3.18, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Growing in God's truth so that the words of Jesus in John 17.17 17 might be fulfilled when he prayed for you and me and said, Lord, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, to talk about discipleship, it's important to look at the Great Commission. So my text this morning is Matthew 28.18-20. through 20 wherein Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And look or behold, remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now this great commission was given to the first disciples, those 12 that group of 12, really the 11 at that point, but again, the title 12 was used as an official designation. But this, this great commission carries on through the local church. Ephesians 2.20 teaches us that the Lord used the apostles to lay the foundation of the church. And Ephesians 4.11-12 through 12 teaches us that now the pastors and teachers and the body of Christ carry on this great work of the Great Commission. So this morning, we see from God's Word that we should be a discipleship-oriented church. The question is, 
how can we be a discipleship oriented church? Well, by studying this passage of scripture, we find that there are several key components of biblical Jesus-centered discipleship. Let's look at these this morning, and you have six in your listening outline in the bulletin. I'm, going, I'm not going to share all of them. Don't get excited. That doesn't mean we're going to get out of here real early. What I'll probably do is share a couple, what I plan to do is share a, a couple of the, the, the last points this evening. We'll see how far we get this morning. Let's look at Jesus' teaching on discipleship, and we, we see, again, a few key ideas here. Number one, we see this from the Word of God. This is so important that we grasp this if we're going to be the disciple-making church Jesus wants us to be. Number one, we find that Jesus sets the agenda for discipleship. Jesus sets the agenda for discipleship. Where do we see this in the text? Look at the opening words. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. It may seem like a strange statement. Why would Jesus remind his disciples of his authority when giving the Great Commission? Well, this is one of his most important instructions ever. It is his mission statement for the church. And as Jesus gave the mission statement for the church, he wanted his disciples to know his mission statement, Jesus' mission statement for his church isn't left to public debate or popular opinion. He did not take a poll when establishing how his church was to operate. He said, all authority has been given to me. The term translated authority here was one that meant the right to determine a course of action. So plain and simple, Jesus is the shot caller. He is the one who has the right to set the agenda for his church. And when Jesus gave the agenda for his church, he said, go and make disciples. Train people. Teach people. Instruct people in the way of God. Make disciples. One has said that the language here refers to Jesus' divinely given and unrestricted exercise of his freedom to act. Hear me this morning, Colossians 1, 16 through 18. Oh, praise be to his name. Jesus is the head of the church. Hear me this morning. We are all, whether pastor, deacon, or saints, we are all a part of the body underneath his headship and his lordship. He deserves the praise in his church, both now and forever. Jesus is the head of the church, and he has authority. We should look to him for insight and destruction. We should be slow to speak, as James said, and quick to listen. We should remember, as Solomon said, many are the thoughts and the hearts and minds of men, but the counsel of the Lord will stand forever. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lamb of God. He is King of all of creation. Right now, he is at the right hand of God, and he has authority over heaven and earth. One day, he will literally physically reign on the earth, proving his dominion over the earth. And may his people who are truly born again May those who are really saved know this. He is the head of the church. And may we put our hands over our mouths. And may we be like many who received a revelation of him. May we say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. True discipleship knows that Jesus sets the agenda for his church. Number two this morning, true discipleship will result in evangelism. There's often debate, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? In the church, there's often debate, which comes first, baptism or discipleship? I'm of this conviction, you can't fully untangle the relationship between discipleship and evangelism. One has a way of fueling the other. 
You set out to engage in evangelism, you will eventually see the need for discipleship as the 2016 through 18 study of the Southern Baptist Convention revealed. You set out to make disciples, get you a group of five people you're going to train and teach and hold accountable to live the Christian life. I guarantee you, in time, there's going to be people saved as a result of that discipleship. Now, we, we see this in Jesus' words. Look at what he said in verse 18, verse 19. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Why does he speak of baptism here? What does he mean by baptism? Well, the word baptism is not a translation of what we see in the Bible. The word baptism is a transliteration. That means the English translators of the Bible took the Greek word and they didn't really translate it. Instead, they transliterated it. What does that mean? You take the actual letters from the original language and you just move them into the new language, the language to which you are translating. And you get a word that sounds nearly identical to the original word. In the Greek New Testament, the word used here is baptizo. English translators back 400 to 500 years ago, 400 years ago or more, chose to transliterate the word. Why? Because in England, back in the 1500s and 1600s, this was a very controversial topic. If you translate Lated this word, you might upset a royal official or the queen herself or the king himself, and it might cost you your life because of the battle between the Protestants and the Catholics. As a result, we have a transliteration here that throughout the ages has led to a lot of controversy and confusion concerning the nature of baptism. The word baptizo meant to dip or to immerse. Why dip or immerse? Because this act paints a beautiful picture of Christian conversion. In fact, the word translated baptism here, baptizo, is used in the famous Greek translation of the Old Testament that was used in Jesus' day. It was called the Septuagint. It was used in 2 Kings 5.14 in a very famous Old Testament story. Perhaps you remember the story about one named King Naaman and the way he wanted to desire to be healed of leprosy. And he came to the promised land and the prophet told him, you want to be healed of your leprosy? Go dip in that river seven times. And this wasn't a mere sprinkling of the river's waters. This was instead the man plunging himself, dipping himself, immersing himself in the waters of the Jordan. And this act of baptism in the New Testament contains such a dipping, such an immersing, such a submersion in water. Why? Romans 6, 3 through 4 tells us baptism was intended by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to paint a beautiful picture of salvation. The baptismal waters in our baptistry do not cleanse anyone and save them of sins. It is your faith in Jesus Christ that saves you. This is the gospel message. You were born for a relationship with God, but you are stained by sin like every human. But God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life on your behalf. And then Jesus died on the cross as a substitute, a sacrifice for your sins. He was raised proving he's God. And if you will repent of your sin, turn from self, turn from sin, turn from this evil world system that's out there, and place your faith in Christ, you will be washed of all of your sin. You'll receive the Spirit of God within your soul. You'll be guaranteed a forever living with God. When one is baptized, one is not saved. One simply gives a picture of what happens when one is saved. One is immersed underneath waters, symbolizing that in Christ the old life is buried and one is raised out of the water, symbolizing that in Christ one has received a new life. Now notice that Jesus, in talking about discipleship, mentions this idea of baptism. Why? 
Jesus knew that when disciples commit to teaching and training people, when disciples commit to making disciples, people will inevitably be saved and born again. This was the finding of our Southern Baptist Convention study started in 2016. I had two personal mentors or mentors or friends who were on that task force. I texted them in preparation for this sermon, asking them about that study. They spent two years studying what Jesus said in one verse. Make disciples, and guess what will happen? More people will be baptized. Hear me this morning, church. One of my prayers for our congregation on a regular basis is this. Give us disciples growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, also give us souls for our labor. Give us converts. Cause our baptismal waters to be stirred often. Know this, in our personal lives, if we'll be committed to making disciples, if we will train other believers, the Lord will add to our numbers. His word is true. So I've recently, for this new year, started two new discipleship groups. One meets every other Monday on, at Los Arcos, 1130. Dustin's a part of that group, met with us this past week. One meets here on campus on Tuesdays at 1030 every other week. I give every other week space. I say, hey, we're not going to meet for two weeks. You take the weeks in between, and you take the material I've given you, and you start a group. Just-in-time training. I've trained you, now you train others. Within that group, one thing we do is this. We ask each other. We hold each other accountable. How are you doing sharing the gospel? Have you witnessed anyone recently? Who's on your list? Who are you praying for? Who are you inviting to church? Why do we do that? Because of the words of Jesus. Discipleship can give birth to baptisms and evangelism. Let's look this morning at a third concept. We see from the text before us that biblical discipleship involves teaching of God's word. Now this is implied in the very word disciple. A disciple is a follower, a learner, a one who receives instruction from both the lifestyle and lessons that a rabbi or disciple maker gives. But Jesus highlighted the role of teaching further in the Great Commission when he in verse 20 said, teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. The word teaching here, one has defined it as meaning to instruct by the word of mouth. To instruct by the word of mouth. While Jesus was on earth, we see over and over again in Scripture that he was intentional to instruct or to teach by word of mouth. Matthew 4, 23 Matthew 9, 35, Matthew 11, 1, Matthew 13, 54, Luke 21, verse 1. You see in Mark's gospel, while Jesus was on the earth, he went to the place of worship on the Lord's day, the synagogue on the old Sabbath, Saturday, and the Bible says he opened the Isaiah scroll and he gave the meaning. Here, the words of Jesus the instruction of Jesus and the Great Commission, but also take note of the example of Jesus. The church is to be a body in which someone on a regular basis opens the Word of God and gives the meaning, explains truth. The early church knew this. They understood the education they received from Jesus and the example they received from Jesus. So Acts 5.42 tells us every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Notice the New Testament precedent. They met in the temple to hear the teaching of God's word, but then they met in various homes. This implies that there were gatherings, there was the public gathering on the Lord's Day, but the church also gathered in small groups, if you will, small discipleship groups, and gave teaching. The pattern of the Lord and the practice of the early church continued as the church age went on. We see even in the New Testament, 
Colossians 2, 7, 1 Timothy 6, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 2, Colossians 3, 16, that instruction, teaching was an integral part of the body of Christ and the early church. Now, know this, teaching of the word of God, one instructing others by the words of his or her mouth is an integral, fundamental indispensable part of discipleship you know we have had a change in philosophy of of education in america right a a man i believe his name was john dewey started this at the beginning of the 20th 20th century and we've seen the results of in american culture over the last 100 years and this has crept into the church now there's benefit in some of the modern techniques of teaching I seek to use and employ some of those. But, but hear me, th- this stuff that's out there in Christianity, of let's all get together and share our opinions and put them on the table and take notes and then synthesize them all, and somewhere in all of that we'll find the truth. That's not how Jesus called us to make disciples. And Jesus, Jesus called us to instruct one another. The Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, before time began, the psalmist said, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The Lord has given us his word. It has come to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus believed every word of this book is true. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And the Lord has called us to take this word and to teach people this word. And Jesus indicated that we grow into Christ's likeness, not through our opinions, not through cultural Christianity. We grow in Christ's likeness, John 17, 17, by understanding God's word. Paul taught in Romans 12, 1 through 2, here's how Christian growth takes place. The mind is informed by the truth of God, and then then we are thereby transformed. So may we be intentional in our discipleship to teach and train people in Christian truth. Oh, this is my heart burden. When I meet with discipleship groups, there's time for us talking. How are you doing in your spiritual life? What's going on? How's your walk with the Lord? Tell the group. There's time at the end. How are you doing witnessing? Are you making disciples? Do you have anybody you're training? But there's a time where I give a handout, and there's fill-in-the-blank outlines, and there's a lot of Scripture For about 20 minutes, I give truth. Sure, there's discussion around that, but the teaching, the teaching comes right from God's Word. Why? In this generation in which we live like never before, people need the truth of God. In fact, Benji's working with me, and we have this goal over the years to produce. We've talked about it. We want to have a method of making disciples where we encourage you to make disciples. I'm going to be more and more over the years as a pastor sharing with you about how I make disciples. So I want to give you that method that you can use, and you can use it here on campus on Sunday nights. You could use it at a coffee shop during the week. You could use it over breakfast on Saturday morning. You could use it in the break room at work. You can make disciples here, there, and everywhere. So we want to give you a method, but we also want to have materials. It's our goal 20 years from now, if the Lord would bless that we have materials and materials and materials on various subjects and various books of the Bible, and we're using this title, Basic Discipleship. We'll be giving classes on Sunday night starting next week, and there's one called Basic Prayer. Uh, There's one, Basic Church Membership, Basic Christian Life. Why basic? All these publishing companies in America, Christian publishing companies, have made things way too complicated. They're writing Christian books. When I look at the title, I'm like, what is it even about? People just need to be taught on prayer. People just need to be taught how to live the Christian life. People need to be taught about why church membership is important. Why are we doing all this? Because truth matters. Transformation in your Christian life comes through the truth of God. Jesus said that. In John 17, 17. So we'll aim to provide this type of teaching through our discipleship emphasis and hear the truth of Christ. Biblical discipleship involves teaching of God's word. Let's look at a fourth component here. We see from the text that, from the words of Jesus, that biblical discipleship also stresses obedience 
to God's word. Obedience to God's word. Now we see this in Matthew 28, verse 19. Look at the words of Jesus. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian formula, teaching them, there's the instruction, to observe, key word, observe everything I've commanded you. Now, that word observe has messed us up to a degree when it comes to discipleship. What do you think about when you think about the word observe? It made me think about going to the Booth Museum across the street, going up to the top floor and walking around that room with all the paintings of the presidents and observing the paintings of the presidents and observing those correspondences from the presidents that they have there. We often think of this word observe as meaning to look at, to regard. The word observe here used by Jesus contained a deeper meaning. It's a word that was used in the first century world of a Roman soldier who stood guard over a strategic location. My brother serves in the United States Army, and I remember him telling me some stories about his time in Afghanistan. He really loves telling me, I can't tell you what I do or I would have to kill you. Uh, He seriously works in intelligence, so he doesn't talk about his job much. But I remember him telling me, hey, when I was in Afghanistan, we all had to take turns various times just doing the simple job of guarding the post and staying up at night, guarding a strategic location. That's how this word was used in the first century. You see it used in this way in Acts chapter 12, verse number 6. Now, we know that an observation in that way. The observing that a soldier does isn't just looking at. You are looking at something in order to guard it, in order to keep it under safekeeping. In fact, we could translate Jesus' words here as saying, teach them to keep or guard everything I've commanded you. Jesus uses this word that was used of a Roman soldier to place stress on the the place of obedience in Christian discipleship. We're not just called to look at the words of Jesus. You are not just called to look at the preacher preaching. I'm not called to just look at the words of the Bible as I read it my daily devotion time. We're not called to just get together in discipleship groups and look at someone teaching us. Oh, remember the teaching of James 1, 22, be hearers of the word and doers of the word so that you don't spiritually deceive yourself. It's not the truth you know in the Christian life, it's the truth you obey. So Jesus taught his disciples, hey, when you teach and train people, train them to obey. Train them not just to know my words, but to keep my words. So all of our attempts at discipleship should have an aim for obedience. How do we do that? Well, in one way, we give application. We, just, we don't just stay in the land of the theoretical, talking about concepts related to God. We take our teaching and we place it in the practical. How are you doing putting this into practice? What are some ways you can put this into practice. In fact, I've often encouraged teachers, sometimes you hear a Christian teacher and they like to teach by discussion. I've often encouraged teachers, never have discussion about the meaning of the text. That is your job as a teacher. Don't go in there and open up to passage like Hebrews chapter six, such a difficult to understand text and say, what does this mean to y'all? They don't know, that's why you're the teacher. Study it and tell them, say, thus saith the Lord from the word of God. But if you do want to have discussion, I like to have discussion. After you've explained the text, here's the place for discussion, teacher. Learn this. Then say, how can you put this into practice? What does this mean for your marriage? What does this mean for your finances? What does this mean for your daily life? What does this mean for your witness at work? Teach for obedience. But then take it a step further. 
when you have discipleship groups, aim to hold people accountable. I, I do this in my discipleship groups. We start off at the time that I would call uh, care and prayer. And we just say, how are you doing in your Christian life? How are you doing with your daily devotional time? Is there anything going on that we can pray for you? It's amazing how that will bring up conversations of, you know what? I've never gotten a habit of regular prayer. And people around the table are able to give input and say, here's how I pray, here's what it looks like, nuts and bolts. We're teaching to obey, as Jesus said. It's amazing how sometimes a man, a young father, might speak up and say, hey, I've got this problem with alcohol, or I've got this issue with what I look at on the computer. It's amazing how someone might say, man, I've never told anybody, but I really struggle with bitterness and unforgiveness. Or it's amazing how somebody might bring up, I've suffered for years with anxiety and I need help. This is where discipleship is different than the preaching time. This is where discipleship is different than life group time. It's a very small group of people where there is confidentiality and encouragement and there is teaching to obey. Accountability. So we see here a picture from Jesus of biblical discipleship and some very important principles. Let's look at one last one we see in Jesus' words in verse number 20. We'll come back and focus on another component of biblical discipleship this evening. Be here for the chili cook-off. You heard about the bad bulletin announcements, right? Have you ever read these before? I heard about the one that said, choir rehearsal with a pinto bean supper, music to follow. Uh, That won't happen tonight. We'll dismiss. Sorry if that's inappropriate. Send an email to blender at tabernaclebaptist.org. So be here tonight for the chili. We're going to share a little bit about, so excited to talk about mission opportunities in the new year. And um, Benji's going to share about discipleship class opportunities where we'll be training in truth. And then I'm going to share a little bit more about discipleship and talk about the sixth point. But notice Jesus' last words. Remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. How is Jesus with us? He's not here physically, but he is here spiritually. The Holy Spirit's in your heart. The Holy Spirit is everywhere present. The Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit is none other than the Spirit of Christ. Christ is within your heart. and Because he's in your heart, you have comfort, encouragement, power, and strength as you live the Christian life. Jesus spoke of this reality in John 16, 7, when he said, Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Jesus has gone away. He was raised from the dead, and he lived for 40 days on the earth, proving that he was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and proving that he was really physically resurrected. Then in front of his disciples, he ascended to the right hand of God, and he is now there ruling and reigning. But know this, there are only two places Jesus dwells. He dwells in heaven at the right hand of God. But if you're a born-again believer who has repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, he also dwells in your heart. And his presence in your heart contains a promise, a promise that you have power over sin, you have power over the old man, but also a promise that you have power for making disciples. Because Jesus said concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1-8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So know this, as we set out to make disciples, as we gather with groups, as we teach people and train people, As I gather with my groups, as we start a new program here on Sunday nights next week, meeting in groups and discipling, we have help from the other side. As we meet, we're not left to our own intellect, our own devices, our own resources, our own flesh, our own physical means. 
for starting a discipleship movement. Instead, we have the Holy Spirit of God with us and in us. And that Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And if we'll be humble, if we'll be faithful, if we'll seek to do Jesus' discipleship plan the way he outlined for it to be done, he, through his Spirit, will work in our midst, and there will be disciples. There will be people born again, people baptized, but there will be disciples making disciples. I can remember when I left uh, First Baptist Lawton, they do what they do. You know, the church had a going away party, but there was a man in the church who'd been an IMB missionary for years, and he told me, he said, Pastor, I know we're having like the, the going away party for you at the end of January after morning worship, but I would really like to schedule a special lunch for me and for you and with a handful of people. And I said, Bill, I, 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 I really appreciate that, but the month is really busy for us with the transition. Maybe we could do something different. He's very insistent. And then he told me what he was planning. He said, I know how you've made disciples on the side, and what, what I would like to do is try to track down everyone who has been discipled through you making disciples. I'd like to have a lunch, and I think it would be really good for you before you transition out of here to see people who have made disciples as a result of you making disciples. And he knew how to had groups and how I encouraged in my groups. Now you go train. And he had followed the tree structure of people had disciples. And that meal was perhaps the most meaningful going away meal as he had people give testimony and there was one there, a, a businesswoman who owned a, a business in town and she had taken upon herself. She was discipled by someone I had discipled and she had taken upon herself in her workplace to take those same materials and those handouts and those outlines we had made available and she had trained women and people who were a part of our community, not even a part of our church. And she gave testimony and said, I've been in church all my life, but I've never known about making disciples. And may God bless First Baptist Lawton. May God bless other churches seeking to make disciples. And may the Lord bless Tabernacle Baptist as we chart out on a new journey seeking to make disciples. Disciples.